Uh, okay, so uh, let's continue on the discussion on deep generative models. Uh, last time, I think I gave you a overarching view about uh, the statistical mathematical foundation of a couple of deep generative models, especially when they embed it in the history of uh, graphical models and the variational inferences and all that. And uh, this le today's lecture will be a little bit more pragmatic. I will uh, talk about a few tricks and uh, new ideas people bring in and to uh, further empower this approach, which make them become more and more practical and, and useful. Okay? So this is the plan of the uh, of the class. Roughly, I'm going to talk about the four to five different models. So it will be kind of superficial, okay? Uh, but the, I posted papers that you can, you can read yourself on the detail part. But I gave you the high level ideas about what happens, okay? So we see this in the past few years. Since the invention of the GAN model, uh, every year there are uh, visible, very visible, uh, tangible improvements on the quality of the production. And you can see you, you start from something like vague. We knew that it is already better than other approaches like VE because it is uh, having this uh, domain, uh, this modality kind of a coverage property under the gun loss function. You still remember that? We, that has something to do with the KL divergence direction and so forth. But then, you know, that alone is actually not enough. Okay, this one is still not too good. You see every year, up to here, it's quite decent already, right? And up to here, you'll see all the details, you know, the wrinkles, everything you know, on the face already. It's some, sometimes it's very difficult even to tell whether it is a synthetic image you know, or fake one, uh, just even by human being. I, re I read some Facebook and some blogs, and they say the trick is to really look at uh, maybe it, are there are their ears kind of look really, really natural and symmetric? Are the teeth look like, uh, you know, uh, a artificial teeth or real one? And the eye, you need to look into very details, and then you sometimes can spot some synthetic natures. Okay. But overall, the quality is very good. So how to achieve that? How people have done uh, to achieve it? Okay, so just to recap, this is the generative adversarial network models, okay? By calling them networks, that means every component, such as this whole generator process, such as this discriminator, is no longer just a trivial function, like a softmax, like a logistic, and so forth. It could be, by itself, a big network of many, many layers and parameters, okay? And uh, so in here, you can see that uh, it implicitly outputs you know, uh, a distribution, Okay, of generated images, it is uh, a implicit distribution because uh, you cannot write an analytical form. This uh, you know, uh, hidden code is trivial. It comes from a standard normal, and then it goes to a uh, multi-stage generation process to get the nonlinear transformations of all kinds. I remember there is a proof many years ago that even a single layer, a two-layer uh, you know, a network function can simulate any arbitrary complex functions. Okay, if you remember that, I think somewhere else you can see the proof. It's kind of intuitive that you can imagine because you already can, you know, have all the nonlinear combinations by having two layers and hidden variables. Okay, therefore this one can be arbitrarily rich and then you generate a picture and so forth. Uh, there is something already quite strange in this authentic uh, vanilla gun, which is that you cannot perform inferences in Z because uh, uh, the posterior of Z, given, say, uh, the Y, is uh, very, very, uh, it's, it's symbolic, but it is not uh, in, in implicit form, uh, at least uh, in the original design. But people also say that why I care about uh, having a Z, the Z doesn't have any meaning in this case because it's a random code, right? So, uh, but, uh, in principle, you actually could you know, infer the Z. Uh, there are some models that I mentioned the last time already that allow you to do that if you really care. So that's basically the GAN model. It has a generative part, has a uh, discrimination part, and you need to learn two sets of uh, parameters, the generative parameters and the discriminating parameters. 
Okay. And then here is the training mechanism, right? You are going to train the discriminator here uh, by, you know, uh, optimizing the 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 the, the cross entropy of the prediction, which uh, drives the D model more and more discriminating. Okay, and then in this part, you also uh, minimize uh, uh, something equivalent to a log loss to make sure that uh, uh, they can maximally fool you know, the discriminator. And here you optimize the G. And then uh, there are analysis, one of which is shown last time already, to further qualify this part to express them in terms of uh, minimizing the distributions between a target and a source. So that you, know, you are learning something that can be measured against other things. Right? So that's usually the foundation of uh, any learning uh, uh, data-driven algorithm. So here it comes the loss. In the original Goodfellow paper, even though implicit, one can show that the loss function can be formulated as uh, the Jensen-Shannon uh, 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 divergence between the empirical data distribution and the generative distribution. By the way, this one is not expressible. It's the whole bag of data. Therefore, it's only symbolically expressed here. Okay? It's showing that uh, what you do here is, after all, optimizing this. But uh, it's not like you directly can do something on that. But at least people know what's happening you know, in the learned model versus uh, the training data set. Then in a later analysis, which I actually shown last time uh, in last lecture, which was done here by uh, one of my grad students, uh, it was showing that uh, what's actually being done here in learning the generative model is to minimize the KL between you know, uh, uh, the inference model and uh, you know, the, the, the variational, uh, the posterior distribution. Right? So we know that. Now, knowing that tells you how to you know, do the moment match and so forth, right? a modality match, not moment match, sorry. And uh, you know basically why you get a good result. But also, you can use that to explain why you didn't get good results. <laughs> okay. For example, uh, suppose your training data uh, is that of uh, a uh, distribution that uh, lies in the so-called the lower dimensional manifold of a higher dimensional distribution. So this is a little bit harder to... So suppose that, for example, you have this uh, three-dimensional space where your data are actually just uh, on this uh, flat plane. That's basically meaning this uh, flat plane is a lower dimensional manifold. But in theory, you still can write it down into a higher dimensional distribution because I may be slightly deviating from the plane. Although I spread very, very widely you know, in that, uh, let me call this uh, X and Y and Z. You know, I have a huge variance along X and Y. I have a tiny variance on Z. That basically effectively leads you to a submanifold distribution. Okay, suppose my data is like this. Okay, and uh, then you know when you want to learn something, uh, you know, uh, as uh, for example, this is a P distribution. I want to learn a Q distribution, which is defined, for example, in the full space, which is three dimensional, like this one. It turns out that uh, those uh, Jensen Shannon divergence and that uh, KL callback Lieber divergence, they are not very good at uh, measuring the distances. Sometimes they have a degenerated numbers. Okay? That's a mathematical phenomenon that uh, you could imagine why it's happening. For example, because uh, the distance is, let's use KL as an example. KL is basically about uh, taking an integration of uh, some Q versus a log of Q over P, right? Now, for this argument to be kind of a meaningful, they have to be non-zero. Otherwise, uh, it would really uh, generate a very little impact on the integral, right? Non-zero means that uh, these two things need to overlap quite a bit, 
in the sense that if you have a two distributions, P and Q, this, which started from being very little overlapping or non overlapping, then this distance becomes uh, degenerated. Okay, it's not uh, uh, meaningful, basically, to, 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 to tell how far two distributions are away. Right. So that's the intrinsic nature of, uh, of uh, some divergence measure, which really assume that uh, the two kind of uh, argument have to overlap a little bit to allow the integration of the cross kind of interaction to happen. Okay. Okay. So it's undefined or infinite. The loss function therefore fails to drive you know, the learning of the Q into a product because it basically loses the target already. So this is like, a, I, I'm trying to imagine a scenario. If you shoot a missile, for example, if your missile you know, uh, can begin with uh, capturing the target, even fake, you know, very weak one, then you get closer and closer and closer, you amplify the signal, it becomes more and more accurate. That's how usually cruise missile were kind of uh, uh, designed. But if you start shooting the air and see no target to begin with, then they couldn't even decide where to go in the first place. Then you lose the goal, right? So that's the problem with the, the KL and the jensen shannon divergence. Okay, so that basically is a key kind of uh, weakness people discovered. People say, oh, to correct the gun, uh, uh, you know, because of the uh, degeneration of the distance, the only thing to do is to just uh, redefine distance. Everything else should be the same. Okay, so that basically comes to this new idea. The loss function are now reinvestigated, uh, and uh, people find that this one, which is called the, the Wasserstein distance, uh, which is known in mathematics, and also in statistics, it's also known as the Earth movers distances, is actually a good one. Okay, for example, um, the Earth and the mover distances actually uh, is sensitive to the shape of the distribution more so than the Shannon, uh, Jensen Shannon divergence and the KL. Why? Because it is empirically measuring this. It's not about uh, how overlap they are and so forth. It's about uh, if you just treat the target and the whatever uh, source distribution as two piles of dirt, you need to, whatever shape they are, they, you need to move you know, the dirt from one to the other, and also the distance it takes to move. For example, these two distributions, if you put it here in here, they actually look the same. Their mass is the same. Okay. But if you move it to the third place, you know, moving this one and moving that one will give you two distances that are different, right? Because uh, this one may take a closer distances to move to the third places, and that one, because it is uh, less in here, more in here, it will take more distances, right? So that, that's it. You know, uh, there is a mathematical form for the Earth's mover distances, but this one solved the problem of uh, two distribution being non-overlapping, uh, in a high dimensional space can still be properly measured. Okay, so very intuitive. And then it comes to the math. Okay, you can write down the divergence function like this, which, by the way, it requires uh, you know, uh, uh, some kind of technical conditions, what people call it. This D, which is the discriminator, uh, needs to be Lipschitz continuous so that when you compute a supremum, you, need to, you can take derivatives. Okay, uh, this is uh, not uh, impossible. You can uh, uh, craft a, uh, a discriminator which is differentiable, fine. But uh, sometimes, you know, uh, uh, there are uh, ill-conditioned uh, uh, kind of uh, scenarios where uh, you see wild gradient, okay? You know, it is differentiable, but what if uh, the, the gradient uh, from that is uh, too wild? Uh, for example, too wild being you have uh, either something called the diminishing gradient, where you start into the valley and therefore your gradient are just flat. Then that means uh, you cannot make progress, however many steps you have. Or it is uh, in a uh, steep kind of a place where uh, it's like you are on top of a cliff, then uh, a little gradient will just get you to the, 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 the bottom of everything. Right? That's no good either. So there are some way to engineer uh, or control the gradient. One is known as the gradient clipping. 
and uh, that's the picture showing you. Without, it basically, it computes uh, the norm of all the gradients and then rescale the gradient against that norm so that uh, they are kind of contained you know, with a, a controllable. This is actually a free parameter you know, to define the threshold. Okay? And uh, that basically makes a gradient like this, now like this. They achieve the same effect, by the way, you know, roughly the same way, but uh, they are a lot more benign to handle. Okay? So with these two things together, you get something that is working. Right. For example, here you see an example of the, the Wasserstein gun versus the vanilla gun. And uh, you can see that uh, here uh, I have uh, you know, uh, two uh, you know, uh, uh, distributions. Sorry. One is, uh, you know, you, you, know you, you have, for example, a, a data distribution and a, a, a variation, you need to take a gradient. And this is the gradient from the gun discriminator. You can see it's either very stiff in here or very, very flat in here. Right? That's kind of what we call the, the, the kind of the, the ill-conditioned gradient. But uh, this one from the water stand, you can see it's kind of a nice looking or very kind of a, uh, walkable. All right, so that's one idea. What's that stand gun? Very, very clever. Very, very minor disturbance of the whole idea, but that one shot is really uh, you know, improving the models a lot. Okay. Second idea, it's known as the progressive gun. Uh, so this is another interesting idea. Suppose that I want to train very, very high resolution images uh, you know, training those images really requires a very, very kind of complex structure, a lot of big data and so forth. You have multiple options. One option where I'm going to talk about in a second is to, yeah, just head on, address the bigness problem and uh, make it work. The other idea is to kind of take a shortcut and detour and try to navigate. Uh, it's like, you know, you remember if you drive a car to climb a mountain, you need to do zigzag a lot, right? So that's one way. You begin by a lower resolution training image, and you begin with a very, very shallow gun model. Okay? And uh, once you have that model, you are going to add some stack on top of it. You initialize you know, with uh, the previous results plus this uh, new layer. You have a slightly higher resolution image. You just uh, keep going and going and going and, uh, until you get a really, really big model. But every time, you are not going to be necessary to uh, train the whole big model because uh, you are gradually expanding the size. That kind of allows you to bypass the, the size bottleneck. Right? And also, it creates an optimization path that is easier to climb, just like you drive your car you know, on the highway you know, in, in the mountain. You know, it, it, it kind of makes the path easier. Right? So that's uh, known as the progressive gun, okay? Two ideas now. The third idea, as I said, is uh, just head on. You know, we have a big gun model, and uh, I don't want to bother myself with all this progressive. Maybe just because I don't have a low-resolution image, or I don't want to make a low-resolution image by subsampling, okay? Then to really deal with uh, the, the size you know, directly, there are also a few ideas. Yeah, you increase the number of parameters, but just make the model big for sure. And you need to now handle, deal with uh, uh, buying powerful GPUs and, and so forth. And that, that part you have to uh, swallow, basically, the bullet uh, to pay a better cost. But such higher powered GPU does exist right now, so it's good. Then training, you, know, uh, you need to now increase the batch size so that uh, uh, you can allow this uh, monster you know, uh, you know, model with a lot of parameters to be able to uh, not overfitting, basically. You know, you have enough data, okay? Uh, but of course, it also increased the computational cost because uh, usually a batch needs to be kept in the memory of the GPU, and you know, GPU memory is very, very expensive. It's, not, it's very limited, so you have to deal with that. Um, 
I think Jensen was very, very happy with the inventor of the, of the gamma, although that's actually a big market for his business right now. So you keep inventing bigger models. And then you can simplify the architecture to uh, improve the scalability. That's more like a algorithmic part. You can shortcut a few uh, connectivities. You can remove some uh, unnecessary structures and so forth. And you see this better and better quality pictures you know, being generated. Okay, three ideas. Uh, okay, Every good is, everyone's good? This is not too difficult, right? Uh, now let's uh, go on to another idea that is popular uh, to, uh, again, you know, amplify or uh, transform uh, a originally very simple model into something more powerful. So this idea is known as the normalizing flow. Okay, again, the idea is very simple. The goal is to how to transform a simple distribution, let's say a uniform distribution, to a complex one. Okay, how to make it arbitrarily complex? We kind of do that all the time. You know, in fact, if you go to our, our library or any other Python library to sample a Gaussian, it's actually transformed from uniform. Right, so we, we know that. But uh, how to go even further? Right? Well, very, very, you know, unsurprising. <laughs> you just uh, keep basically evolving the distribution, you know, all the way into a step you're happy with. In fact, uh, here I have examples exactly as what I said. You start from a uniform or a unit Gaussian. After a few, what is known as the polar transformation, what is known as the radial transformation. You can imagine if we are in a polar coordinate system, you have the pole and you have the radial. Right? These two dimensions can all be uh, transformed in nonlinear way or whatever, and you get something very, very, very interesting. Right? So up to here, you can hardly recognize where the original thing is. So this idea is proven powerful. How to do it mathematically? It turns out to be not too difficult. So what's happening is that uh, you started from a uh, kind of a source distribution. You draw Z. You apply a F transformer on Z. You get X. And uh, the mass behind it is, uh, you know, it's not, uh, it, it's, it's uh, again, if you want to make the mathematics very beautiful and all under control, you want you to learn the model in a uh, generative and also, uh, you know, uh, inferential kind of, uh, uh, EM fashion or iterative fashion, you need to be able to infer the original Z so that you can pass the message back, right? Therefore, one requirement is that your transformation need to be invertible. That's not too difficult. There are functions having that kind of behavior. And then your density can be actually computed, you know, analytically, you know, using a uh, change of variable type of, uh, uh, you know, a theorem, right? So. And here you see there. I, I need to know the, uh, the 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 invertible form of the transformation, and also I need to be able to compute the determinant of the Jacobian of that. And uh, well, you can further constrain the Jacobian so that the determinant is uh, computable. It's easy. One idea is to make the Jacobian uh, uh, you know triangular matrix. Yeah, so these are just, uh, you know, very, very uh, standard uh, engineering, you know, applied uh, mathematical engineering to uh, make the whole thing work. And then once this, you know, uh, idea uh, is now in, in the play, you can apply multiple times to have uh, sequential transformations. And that basically amounts to just having multiple multiplications of this, and in the log space, you become a summation of all these transformations. Okay. So that idea you know, leads to a number of uh, interesting variations, and this one is uh, uh, one of the popular ones that uh, you started from uh, one step kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, from the input, and then these are basically all the layers uh, that uh, you can uh, you can basically use. Right? So this one is called the the, the, the activation normalization and the invertible one by one convolution and affine coupling. So you can basically insert 
many, many different effects that you want. Uh, and of course, you know, this could go all the way to a few dozen layers or even hundreds. Okay. So that's the idea. Building from, uh, you can see uh, in one thing that has been advocated in uh, the deep learning community, which I like it very much, is uh, this uh, notion called compositionality, right? So you can see that uh, bigger kind of uh, structure and models can really, really build very, very nicely on smaller building blocks, which has nice mathematical property. And, you know, they, they, they generate some decent images. Not as good as the gun model, honestly. Okay. Uh, that's uh, what people compared. But uh, it's very, very easy and cheap to compute. OK. These are two, uh, a few kind of uh, very, very straightforward tricks, which uh, does not require uh, too strong mathematical sophistication. I'm going to end with uh, another bigger idea, which is uh, more profound and uh, more versatile. And then we're going to close the deep generative model uh, lecture. So this idea is uh, about uh, how to integrate domain knowledge in deep learning. You can see the topic is already very big. How to integrate domain knowledge. Uh, that's almost a half space of the whole learning universe, right? You, know, you, you, you need to uh, you know, use data, but also the entire story about the Bayesian inferences and the regularized uh, machine learning is about the how to marry the data with knowledge. Therefore. We're going to talk about that in the world of deep learning. In the world of non-deep learning, we probably still remember a few ideas. Right? I talk about the Bayesian inferences. Uh, for example, uh, if you still remember, how do we uh, uh, deal with uh, uh, the data sparsity problem in learning HMM you know, uh, models for the casino, if you remember that? Data sparsity means that uh, I didn't see a particular uh, dice rolling configuration, or I didn't see uh, enough uh, switching between the dices. What do you do? If you remember a trick in our parameter estimation. Hey, time to claim some credit. <laughs> Ideally, in the future, I want this to jump out of your almost like uh, instantly, you know, because uh, these are almost like, uh, you know, uh, the, the most, most fundamental kind of uh, weapon. You know, if you are a soldier, imagine these are your, your bayonet that you have to pull out whenever you are in danger, right? Yeah? Want to suggest something? Don't be afraid. It's fine to be wrong. You basically, uh, okay, so uh, you are going to add some numbers into those zero values, which is, they have a good name, in fact. Pseudo count, yes. Yeah. Pseudo count actually can be explained in two ways. One is uh, explained as a Bayesian prior that you have, uh, I believe it's a Dirichlet prior, right, where the alpha is the pseudo count. And the other could be uh, just a, uh, a regularizer. Right, you can basically you know, just you know, think about the, the, the log of the, the prior part and then make the loss function to be in the log space. Then you, you know, remember in uh, our learning of linear regression and the logistic regression, you can basically you know, clamp the value and so forth. Right. Yeah, so these are basically what we do you know, uh, to incorporate prior knowledge because in prior knowledge is here is saying that uh, I don't believe those numbers should be zero. Okay, that's my prior knowledge. Therefore, I'm going to put some numbers there, say these are numbers in my imagination. So I put it there. In deep learning, it's a little bit harder because, uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, learning deep learning is about the learning the weights. Uh, you can say the weights are non-zero. Well, fine, this is too trivial. Simply by saying some weights should be zero, should be non-zero, is not enough. And also, there are too many weights for you to take care of. You can either say they are all non-zero or zero. That's not good. And there are other things like, um, in fact, I have a few other things. Let me give you examples. What are the human knowledge? For example, here is a piece of human knowledge. We all use it very, very uh, comfortably. Right? How to uh, change uh, a verb into a past tense. You just uh, add a ed in most of the time. That's a rule. Right? You use it. 
You don't need to use a millions of examples to train that. Right? I just tell you, remember this rule. People got it. Right? And uh, there are other examples, you know, uh, which you will see more interesting, but I'm going to show you in, the, in a second. Uh, that's... Uh, what did I miss in here? Yeah. So, um, again, in deep learning, you know, you need to rely very heavily on labeled data, and it's not interpretable and hard to encode human limitations, intentions, and knowledge. That's basically what I already said. Deep learning becomes uh, a difficult, more difficult than the general machine learning models for regularizations of that kind. And say how to incorporate this rule into your language model. Um, so here are some common ideas we learned before. Uh, you, you want to learn a model, say a generative model, and uh, you can condition the model on inputs. And in most cases, the inputs are you know, just training data. And, uh, and in this case, you know, uh, uh, imagine that you, you do image, then there are a lot of images. And uh, you can imagine that uh, I have uh, a more kind of, uh, you know, uh, richer definition of the X, which uh, could be more than just, uh, and it could be a sentence label or some other things. You can call them knowledge, you can call them data, but uh, how to incorporate a data or a knowledge that is uh, not in the form of uh, a training data point. For example, a rule is not a training data point, right? How can you incorporate that with it? So imagine a very abstract way. Suppose that I can have a, a constraint function uh, which are additionally parameterized. In fact, here, discriminator is almost like an inspiration of such a thing. You know, it's a different function from the generative model, and it is to discriminating fake from truth. It's using basically a separate loss function. And then what people do is to combine this one with the original loss function so that you can co-train it. Right? Or you can alternatively train it. That's also fine. So if you can really incorporate the knowledge also into a uh, constraint function, and then you can imagine that uh, you know, uh, I can push the model such that uh, this value, uh, when it's becoming higher, then the knowledge is uh, respected. For example, imagine this uh, uh, very, very empirical task about uh, uh, post-image generation. You can imagine these are very interesting applications, right? You know, if you, are, you run a fashion app, you, know, you can pretty much try on fashions for people. But uh, it turns out that uh, use gun to generate an image uh, sometimes give you scary results. Uh, this one is not too bad. There could be worse ones. You, can, you already can probably see this head isn't quite nicely positioned, right? You could often even, in fact, this dress is also kind of uh, inverse. And you may be using a limb or so forth. And, uh, but uh, what if you have a, uh, a, a pose which uh, puts the constraint, which says that, uh, hey, for a non-acrobat, you know, a real human, a normal human, and then he should have his, uh, or she have, have her head on the top and the limb at here and, uh, and uh, arms here and, and legs and so forth, there is a regular position a pose that uh, you want to constrain, assuming that this one is not a, a gymnast or a, a acrobat. Okay. So how to basically you know, encourage uh, a generation of the picture that is a respected constraint? Well, typically what you do is that uh, after you generate, not the end of the job yet, you are going to run a parser. Okay. Maybe the parser can be parallelly applied to a real image and a generated image and then you compare whether the structure is consistent, right? So this is a little bit different from the GAN model in the sense that in the traditional GAN model, you only say whether this one is uh, fake or true comparing to a real image. But in here, you are comparing whether the content, the post, the post makes sense or not. That's a much more complex comparison. And you imagine that if this one is uh, kind of a becoming integrated into the model, you are likely to have a generation machine that is uh, you know, uh, more kind of uh, consistent with uh, human gesture. Right? So that's an image example. 
And that's also telling you why you know, rules can be very important in addition to the labels, or even in absence of the labels. Labels sometimes are less meaningful or interesting. You say, oh, this is a true image. That's a label. So what? Uh, you, you still don't know why it is true. Right? So here you have the reason. In language generation, same thing. Uh, for example, people sometimes, especially in chatbots, in these days, you know, uh, caregiving conversational system for depressed people or for patients, you need to not only generate the right content, uh, but also you need to have the right sentiment. You need to show sympathy, uh, empathy, you know, all that kind of thing, right? How to generate it, or how to sense you know, uh, the, the, the party of the dialogue have that kind of sentiment. So here's a sentence. This is a terrific movie, okay? But you know, the director could have done better. I can tell you for a naive kind of a, you know, a, you know, a language classifier, uh, it's not necessarily easy to detect the senti sentiment behind this movie. So maybe you can help me. Do you think this uh, uh, sentence is reflecting a positive sentiment or negative one? Imagine the way you speak. <laughs> well, well, maybe you are a very direct person. Maybe you are a very, very diplomatic person. And depending on who you are, you do sit, speak differently. But let's imagine uh, we are just pretty normal guys and girls, and what should we, how should we speak? Yeah, it is a positive or a negative? You can agree it's negative, right? And why it's negative? Well, you have a pretty good positive stuff, pretty movie, right? And yeah, there are something not so good, but if you count the number of words, they're roughly the same, right? So it, it's not like a, you know, a, one is dominating the other one so obviously. Why you feel it's negative? Yeah, the but basically is a dominating basically the sentiments, right? So this is a rule. You know, we, 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 we learn English, we know that uh, there is a particular way of uh, expressing are revealing the sentiment, and but is one such way. So it becomes a rule. It's a logical rule. That rule can be very, very helpful you know, when you know it in generating the sentence or when you perceive the sentence. And uh, usually, you know, train a similar capability is almost impossible, or even if possible, you have a lot of, lot of examples, labeled ones. Okay? Because uh, if you count the words and so forth, or count the word to back kind of... Uh, you know, volume and so forth, you know, it's hard to distinguish, right? So these are examples basically uh, about the rules that you do want to incorporate into a complex model, say this uh, P of theta model. And how to do that? Well, we know that uh, we can describe uh, or we can capture that uh, constraint with a function. And uh, then we also know that uh, just like what we do in our gun training with the discriminator, we can also you know, uh, fold that into a loss function so that uh, the value okay, of uh, that constraint function under the expectation of uh, the generation, P theta is, those, is the model who generates the X. Right? And uh, if uh, under this distribution they are big, you say that it is a good distribution. P theta is good. Okay, so that basically gives you a very generic kind of idea about uh, aggregating, you know, a multiple source of losses. This is the regular objective, such as cross entropy and so forth. These are the regularization. So this is a greater idea than the standard, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, a sparsity regularizer and so forth. So we can put it there symbolically. So now. You need to compute it, and as we know from last time, you can kind of already guess this term can be difficult to compute. Do you still remember why that's the get, uh, that, that's uh, why there is a difficulty? I believe two lectures ago. Uh, oh no, last lecture actually I mentioned it. You need to basically take a derivative of this guy versus theta. And what will happen when you take the derivative? (laughs) 
okay, you missed once, but I can't tell you again. I want you to remember. Okay, so this is a very basic trick. Usually, when we are taking derivative of an expectation against a distribution of something, you need to use the log probability trick. And at the end of the day, there will be a term which is uh, the log of the probability itself and something else. And we say that uh, this one will explode the magnitude of that term. Therefore, you have uh, extreme instability okay, or high variance. Okay. Okay, so I'm not going to copy the equation here. You can go back. It's the same equation that we reviewed last time in the weak sleep algorithm, if you remember. Why we do the weak uh, the, the, the sleep step? It's because that uh, true KL uh, is uh, giving you this nasty property. Then we swap the EKL direction. You get a, a better one. Right. So these are the mathematical insights I really want you to get. You know, it, that, that, that's really why some people have a good math intuition without doing too much derivative. When you stare at this, you already see something wrong. Okay. All right. So then, you know, we have, again, out of our standard toolbox, a few ideas. The original one is no good. Let's uh, introduce something called a, uh, uh, maybe a, uh, 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 a variational approximation, okay, to the true distribution. So basically, this one is too hard to deal with. And this is not a KL divergence, therefore you cannot swap functions, right? Therefore, I'm going to directly approximate the P using a Q function, okay? Then I have a uh, kind of a, a minimax thing. On the one hand, I want to maximize this loss under a, uh, you know, uh, approximating distribution. And uh, the other hand, I need to, you know, minimize the discrepancy between the approximating distribution versus the true one I want to learn. Therefore, I now explain this term into two terms. Okay, one is the KL, the other is the, uh, the expected loss. And this technique, again, has been used many, many often time, you know, in machine learning. It's called the regularized base method. And there, I think there is a pointer somewhere you can read the original paper, uh, which was written a long time ago. Okay, yeah, so that's a, re a reference point. So introduce a variation node, you impose a constraint on Q instead, and then you encourage this. So suddenly there is uh, a new entity introduced in this framework, and uh, you will see how we call it. It's a very interesting idea. Okay, so you have uh, this uh, new objective function, and you can also introduce uh, one more parameter, which is uh, uh, a scaling parameter alpha to kind of uh, control the relative uh, contribution of these two parts, right? This is uh, the original data-driven loss, and this is uh, the new knowledge-driven loss, and uh, which one will believe more? Remember in our uh, Bayesian inference, uh, and in our uh, uh, regularized regression, we also have that parameter, regularization constant, that allows you to determine the balance. You can also learn it, by the way, if uh, you really, really want to use a data-driven approach. Okay, so we're here. Um, and there are, again, three parameters like lambda and so forth, which are, again, allowing you to control the contributions from all different parts. Then we apply the EM algorithm type of approach to do alternating optimization. Our goal is to learn the Q as a stepping stone. Remember my mountain climb, cliff climbing kind of example. This Q is the stepping stone for you to learn the P. And uh, then you know, with the Q, you can learn the P, the theta under P, you know, with this and uh, alternatively. And uh, here, of course, uh, you can have uh, uh, tricks to uh, parameterize the learning function, or the constraint function. One technique is known as uh, the soft constraint, which is uh, not just discrete tape, uh, label, say zero and one. It is uh, more like a smoothing kind of uh, uh, differentiable loss to honor the rules. Okay, that's just a choice. Okay, so let's see how this learning algorithm can take place. So you consider learning this model, a supervised learning. And I'm not, not putting everything back into the bigger context because the label, the data does have label as well. These are the hard labels. 
plus, of course, my soft max rules, right? And uh, your target input space is uh, X and Y. And then you have a few other rules, R, which are weighted by lambda. You have uh, multiple rules. And uh, I consider them to be all data of, of some sorts. In fact, uh, in our recent uh, uh, more unifying framework, maybe I will cover that by the, before the end of the semester, these are all called generic, generalized experiences. Your data points are experiences, right? Your rules are experiences. And down the road, you will hear that even reinforced learning, the reward function is an experience, okay? And there are many, many experiences. They can all be treated the same way. Therefore, we don't need to use names like supervised, unsupervised, reinforced, or active, and so forth. They are all the same learning. That's possible. But going back, given L rules, I'm going to now alternating between training the variational and also going back to training the true generative model using uh, the variational in here. That's very important. It is easier to compute, okay? And the here it incorporates already the last previous version of the true and the set of rules. Okay. So this idea is uh, uh, reported in this paper, which uh, is now a very, very important uh, kind of a cornerstone paper for many of techniques followed uh, on, you know, uh, on knowledge integration. But there was actually something kind of, uh, I wouldn't say similar, but uh, uh, kind of, uh, uh, you know, maybe uh, uh, an uh, analytical kind of, uh, you know, in for the same goal, is called the uh, knowledge distillation by Hinton. So here is the uh, knowledge. Basically, the idea is that uh, you want to learn a difficult target, and uh, instead of learning target uh, directly in a single one shot, uh, you are going to iterate. You know, uh, using you know a auxiliary queue, and uh, I don't know why. I think the deep learning community, as I mentioned, they are very very good at giving good names of the technique. So they call this queue now. They uh, where is the queue? The teachers. <laughs> okay. So these are the we call them variational approximation. They call them teachers, and now I also call them teachers because I like the name. <laughs> okay. So uh, uh, it's uh, not just one teacher. Uh, the Hinton paper was advocating an uh, ensemble of teachers. You are going to have all that, many. And then you know, uh, what's happening is that uh, we are going to match those teachers, uh, match those students with the teacher using kind of a soft, a soft prediction. Uh, the teacher are predict predicting soft value. It's not just zero one. Zero one are usually the labeled data, very soft, very hard. But the teacher are coming from a model queue. You can actually generate uh, whatever softness that you want by designing the function, right? So just like you know, when I teach you, I don't want you to just recite or memorize something, right? I, I'm teaching you in a soft way that you can think. Right? So that's the mechanism. And then by doing so, this interaction between the teachers and the students eventually gets the students closer to some or one of the teachers, or maybe the average of the teachers, and then mission accomplished. So this is kind of uh, similar to what uh, we do, you know, because uh, we are also talking about, uh, you know, uh, learning, you know, using, training this teacher in one step, and then use the teacher to train the students in the other step. And just to dig a little bit deeper into the math, that part uh, is basically where the true labels are provided in the training data. Therefore, in a sense, that loss is measuring just the, the discrepancy between your Y label, which is a hard label, versus something that you predict from the current generator. Imagine that this is, uh, say, a uh, gun model which uh, predict, uh, produce the image X and also the label of the X, Y, okay? And it's soft. And then, now that we have a Q, Q is also producing Y, right? Just like uh, the theta, uh, the, uh, the, the P. But P is something that is evolving. It, it, it's been training you know, uh, in every iteration. Q is going to be something like this. 
which is the current version of the P plus those uh, summation of the experiences. And uh, you can introduce uh, either a soft max function or something to generate a soft prediction. And they can be also compared with uh, this. Okay. In a sense, in this way, you also can learn the parameter, or you can leverage on, you can measure the quality of this teacher at this point. Or drive you know, the theta to be closer to what you have now, because here you have this and some new knowledge uh, constraints that you encode it. And then you introduce a weighted partition, right? You, you weigh this by pi, you weigh that by one minus pi. And that gives you the whole loss. And then you are going to update your theta. Okay, so the, the whole design is, uh, in a sense, quite intuitive and clean. And here is basically a, a graphical illustration, right? Your goal is to learn this guy, which uh, is parameterized by theta. It's the original gun model parameters, plus uh, maybe the discriminators and everything. And uh, this is a network. Then there are you know, two type of uh, losses, right? One is uh, basically uh, measured between this and this, the labeled data, okay? And the other is uh, this uh, soft loss because of the teacher. And uh, that soft loss is uh, providing another pooling force with the knowledge of the constraints. And uh, you can imagine that uh, here I can have also unlabeled data because uh, training this you know, can use a self-labeling. It's like the teacher can have in his pocket multiple textbooks, okay, and uh, always uh, different rules and everything. Then I'm going to repetitively engage with this student and hopefully draw him closer to me. And how to, but is the teacher also a kind of a static? Well, the teacher also evolves, okay? You basically have this uh, you know, a little box where the teacher gets also updated from the current version of the students and at the same time incorporate all the logical rules. So you can see this whole machinery, which is uh, called by us uh, a teacher-student model, has the labeled data, has the unlabeled data, has the rules. These are the three pockets of inputs. Okay. And then you have a auxiliary model called the teachers, and you have the target model called the students. Okay. So this is a big idea, a bigger idea, because uh, the, idea, the, the, the technique applies to all kinds of rules, you know, as long as you can express them in terms of a f function, okay, a teaching function. And uh, it will be using all data, labeled or unlabeled, okay? Uh, but of course, uh, you need to, uh, uh, in fact, it gives you the opportunity to even design the architecture of uh, this model and also the teaching model so that uh, you can control or uh, interfere or, you know, or uh, impact you know, the rate or the efficiency of the learning. Okay. Uh, let's see what I have. Yeah, you know, there are some free parameters that you can keep learning. You can, you can actually get for, uh, you know, if you want, such as the lambda, which are the importance of the rules. Uh, and uh, and uh, there are maybe even the, even the f function has a phi. And uh, that's, uh, you know, even the more kind of technical parameters inside each rule, you can also learn it, okay, if you care to, uh, to use a data-driven approach. Okay, with that, I think I'm ready to close. Oh, I was still early. Uh, okay, maybe we can have time to take some questions. Any questions until now? Are we still uh, aligned on the teacher-student model? Okay, so the, the devils, of course, are in the details because it sounds like uh, quite easy, right? You know, it's all like nice looking intuitive thing, but of course, you know, uh, there are non-trivial, uh, you know, undertakings, you know, for any practitioners. Writing the rules into a function requires a lot of skill, okay? The easier one could be just a delta function, that uh, rule honored, rule not honored, and that's pretty trivial. 
Uh, but uh, remember, many of these functions need to have a nice properties like differentiabilities and uh, all, that kind of thing. So uh, different functions do have different effects. Okay. And also, uh, how to expand the space of uh, the inputs beyond the logical rules is actually very interesting. One of our recent work is to, again, as I mentioned, uh, uh, put uh, the reward function in reinforced learning as a type of a teaching function here. Therefore, you know, uh, reinforcement learning becomes just uh, an instance of uh, experience-driven or knowledge-driven machine learning, okay? With the same equation. In fact, you can introduce uh, the same auxiliary function like this uh, and do reinforcement learning. I think there is a, a topic called uh, variational reinforcement learning. That's roughly in, this, in line with this idea. You need to put uh, some variational distributions as a placeholder. But uh, I believe this framework is making things more clean now. And also, it is uh, potentially admissible to more other learning paradigms, as long as you believe that uh, these are the three sources of your data. Okay. Therefore, we have a more general ways of defining the experiences. Then, you know, uh, loss in here, architecture in here, still is a hot topic. You can, you know, really, you can maybe insert a LSTM model in here so that you can build sequential models, you know, for language and for other things. Or maybe even a combination of uh, that with, uh, you know, uh, convolution networks and so forth. Okay, uh, now let's look at some results. Uh, so here is uh, a picture you saw. You can kind of see the comparison, right? Um, this is uh, uh, the base model. You can see that generation isn't very ideal. And if you just have a fixed constraint, which is uh, not a soft rule, but a fixed one, therefore it's a one-time shot that you cannot differentiate and incrementally update, well, this image is kind of scary. And uh, then you allow the constraint to be learned. Okay, their weights, lambda, can be adjusted. You start to see, you know, better and better images, all the way to a target image that everything has accomplished. So you can see then in terms of the numbers, uh, there are some measurements of quality uh, from uh, uh, quantitative and human evaluation. You can see that uh, the score, you know, uh, from these learned constraints can be significantly you know, better than many of the alternative approaches. Okay. Some approaches manage to get a, a, a good number uh, uh, that is uh, kind of mechanical. It's just like, uh, for example, uh, in NLP, we measure quality of the language by a blue score. And uh, you can actually achieve sometimes a good blue score. But even so, when people read it, it doesn't make too much sense. So that's why the human kind of uh, evaluation is introduced. You want to achieve a balance of uh, you know, more kind of uh, objective uh, quality and also more subjective quality. Okay, so uh, that's a summary. So under the umbrella of the deep generative models, especially the uh, generative adversarial network models, uh, people keep kind of uh, innovating on different components in that model, uh, including like a, a new distance function for the objective, right? And uh, a procedure for training, progressively more and more fancier complex model, or to scale up brute force fashion, you know, on larger models. And then there are also quite intuitive and straightforward ways of uh, uh, evolving uh, from simple model to complex one, which is known as the normalizing flow. And then there is this uh, bigger uh, general purpose framework of uh, uh, knowledge ingestion and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and learning uh, inside the deep learning framework using a teacher-student models. I think that's all. Any questions for today? Yes. Thank you. 
Hmm. Yeah. Um, if people, you know, from a, a layman's perspective, we imagine that there is a wise man or a, a kind of a, a particular agent which can suggest me a function. And the, our definition of function could be a mathematical expression, any form. I tell you that's impossible because the machines are never intended. They cannot write your equation, right? Usually in machine learning, when we say learn function, we usually say it is a kernel-based approach where we learn the weights of some base functions, right? So that's basically about uh, functional learning. Functional learning is not about learning the form of the, the expression of the function. It's about learning the weights of the basis of the function. And then we claim that uh, this combination of the basis can be arbitrarily rich, therefore they can kind of approximate anything. Right. So in this case, you can see, I made it clear that my f is not expressed as uh, a sum of the lambda and the little fi's. Right. So here the fi's are what you can imagine as the kernel function, which is a basic delta function or some kind of a, a additional kernel. And then the weights allows you to kind of a, do linear or nonlinear combinations of that. And that part can be data driven. And it's actually good to have a data driven approach in here because uh, you may have all the rules, but you don't know how important they are relatively and also compared to the data. <clears throat> right. <clears throat> so that's why <clears throat> in a true <clears throat> uh, Bayesian setting, uh, people, you know, the, 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 uh, the imaginary counts, the zero counts, sometimes was set as also a hyperparameter. You can actually learn that with a hyperprior over those hyperparameters and then get you some uh, 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 flex speed to accommodate, you know, a different uh, natures of the training data. Good question, yeah. So it's, it's, it's uh, to some degree learnable, but uh, not... Uh, uh, totally uh, uh, freestyle learning. Yeah. More questions? I have another five minutes, uh, so I could dismiss you now, <laughs> or I can have us another three minutes. So now, if you learned all this and you didn't ask too much questions, what do you want next? Do you want to take something like this, go home and play with it? And the build your tool, or you you, uh, you you prefer build it yourself when you are working on a project. I'm trying to get a temperature of uh, the needs, you know, in a class like this. Please speak up. This isn't a difficult question, hopefully. It's not even a technical question, right? It's really a market question. I'm trying to see what is needed here. Or maybe I should alternatively ask, uh, could you find a supply of uh, these kind of implementations in an easily used fashion now or sometime later? And if you find it, what do you do with that? Still no question <laughs> and no answer. Then why, 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 why do you guys come here? <laughs> to get a credit, I guess, right. Sure. Uh, I ask because, uh, uh, you, know, you know, I'm also working on a startup and uh, we're trying to build the world best and the largest and the first AI toolkit for people to build stuff using building blocks. And I wonder if I make this stuff a building block, do I have an audience to use it or not? That's to put it straight, this is the question. For free, by the way, no charge. <laughs> yes, please. Um, I guess for game, game is super interesting, but like there is no easy toolbox that you can go and use for that kind of application. So having that centralized would be useful. I mean, specifically, there are applications that are really image-based, but there are like thoughts of applying it to generating kind of regression-based problems from different distributions. Mm -hmm. But that seems like a problem on its own, just because there is no easy framework like PyTorch doesn't have that built in where you can mm -hmm. go and play around with. Right, right. And of course, there's a reason why there isn't such a tool. It's expensive to build. It's not easy. 
And if people spend money building and no one use it, uh, then you bankrupt yourself, right? So that's something I do worry about <laughs> as uh, the, the leader of the business. As a professor, of course, I would love to, to have that made available to you. So yeah, we are thinking about building two boxes like this for my next year's class so that uh, you know, people can maybe even starting from the fourth semester class for you know, intro to machine learning. We can be, but you know, any toolbox is start with something simple. This is really, really advanced. You will wait until sometime. But uh, other tools like a HMM, a CRF, you know, a regression could be made very easy. On the other hand, you can, you can download the HMM and CRF all over the place. So I wonder whether it's nice to have a central place that uh, you can do experiments, you can do drag and play, you can also contribute, deposit your own implementations. That's the idea that I've been thinking. Let me know, you don't have to answer today. Feel free to write to me if you want to be a user or want to be an author you know, of uh, those, those two boxes. Okay, thank you very much.